Hello, this is Dennis Polis with another video demythologizing quantum theory. Last time I said my next video would deal with wave particle duality and matter. On reflection, I've decided to insert a discussion of some puzzling experiments on wave particle duality and light, namely delayed choice and quantum eraser experiments. Necessarily, this video will be more technical than part one. These experiments are of minor value in the context of the scientific method, as they merely further confirm quantum theory, which already has universal acceptance in the physics community. In other words, these experiments observe exactly what quantum theory predicts. Still, they have made a major contribution to quantum mythology. Some see them as implying backward causality and undermining the reliability of logic. Those of you who are familiar with my projection paradigm know that human knowledge is the result of projecting or mapping our experience into a limited conceptual space, a system of ideas. In any mature person, most of these ideas already exist. Sometimes, however, we see that our stock of pre-existing concepts is inadequate to our experience, and new concepts are called for such is the case with quantum physics. The old particle concept simply does not fit our experience of the quantum world. Using it is like putting a square peg in a round hole. Grr. The wave concept does fit, but requires further extension and elaboration. The interpretation of delayed choice in quantum eraser experiments illustrates this point. John Archibald Wheeler was a prominent physicist who is most famous for reviving interest in the general theory of relativity. He was also very interested in the interpretation of quantum theory. Wheeler did not believe in wave-particle duality in the sense of quanta being both at the same time. Instead, he based his view on Bishop Berkeley's idealism. In a 1992 Scientific American article, he explained his position. The thing that causes people to argue about when and how the photon learns that the experimental apparatus is in a certain configuration and then changes from wave to particle to fit the demands of the experiment's configuration is the assumption that a photon has some physical form before the astronomers observe it. Either it was a wave or a particle. Either it went both ways around the galaxy, or only one way. Actually, quantum phenomena are neither waves nor particles, but are intrinsically undefined until the moment they are measured. In a sense, the British philosopher Bishop Berkeley was right when he asserted two centuries ago, to be is to be perceived. It is hard to imagine what it would mean to perceive a non-existent object. So few of us can accept the idea that things come into existence only when we perceive them. Still, there is some truth to Wheeler's view. The idea we have of things depends on how we perceive them. That is not a problem unless we are foolish enough to think that our ideas of things exhaust their reality. In an effort to convince people of his view of quantum reality, Wheeler invented a number of thought experiments. Thought experiments are ones you do in your imagination rather than in the laboratory. His so-called delayed choice thought experiments were meant to show that it makes no sense to think of quanta as either particles or waves before we observe them. In the last few years, ways have been found of doing delayed choice experiments in the laboratory. I will try to show that none of them require us to think of light quanta as anything other than waves. One type of experiment, based on a modified Mach Zender interferometer, produces results that puzzle many people. Examining this type of experiment will show the confusion underlying them all. I'll start by explaining what Mach Zender interferometer is and how it works. Then the modification used in delayed choice experiments will be more understandable. Light enters here, immediately encountering a half-silvered mirror acting as a beam splitter. Half the beam passes through 
and half is reflected to the upper mirror, which reflects it along the top path to another half silvered mirror, which reflects half of it into the upper detector. The rest passes through to the right detector. Meanwhile, the part of the beam that passes through the first half silvered mirror continues along the bottom path and is reflected up to the second half silvered mirror. There, half of it continues to the upper detector and the other half is reflected into the right detector. So each detector sees half of the upper beam and half of the lower beam. What is the point of all this splitting and recombining? One point is to show that light is a wave. By changing the length of one path relative to another, we can change the arrival time of one beam in relation to the other. In this graph, the blue and green lines represent the strength of each of the two beams, while the red line represents their sum. As we vary the arrival time of one beam relative to the other, the sum of the beams varies between a maximum when they are in phase to zero when the troughs of one wave cancel the crests of the other. The delayed choice experiment is based on the assumption that photons are not just a quantity of energy absorbed and emitted by atoms, but light particles existing between emission and absorption. In part one, we saw that there is no more evidence for light being a particle than there is for leprechauns. So I have recruited Finnegan, the leprechaun, to play the role of a photon particle. In the modified interferometer, the final half-silvered mirror is removed. The story we are told is that light entering the apparatus sees no interference will be measured and so chooses to be a particle. When it gets to the first beam splitter, it has a 50-50 probability of following either the upper or the lower path. We can tell which path it decided to follow by seeing which detector was activated. The idea of the delayed choice experiment is that after the light has entered the modified apparatus having decided to act like a particle, we randomly change the ground rules by reinserting the mirror, forcing it to act like a wave. Picora! Finnegan then invokes an ancient druidic spell to change into a wave. The choice is delayed because it happens after Finnegan has entered the apparatus, but before detection. In the actual experiment, some refinements are introduced. First, the beam consists of single photon pulses. Secondly, the beam splitter is not moved physically into place, but is turned off and on electronically, driven by a random noise generator. When we sort the data into observations with and without the final beam splitter inserted, we see that the apparatus acts like a normal mock sender interferometer when the final beam splitter is inserted. When it is not inserted, no interference is observed. An alternate way of telling the story is that the photon has to decide if it is acting like a particle and follow only one path or like a wave and follow both paths. If the final beam splitter is removed, then one or the other detector will go off and tell us, so the story goes, which path the photon followed. On the other hand, if the final beam splitter is in place, the beams from the two paths are combined and we get interference and lose the which path information. The experimenters quote Wheeler to summarize their conclusion. Thus, one decides the photon shall have come by one route or by both routes after it has already done its travel. What's wrong with the story we're being told? First, it assumes that photons are particles. As I showed in part one, there is no evidence for this. This assumption turns a simple experiment confirming quantum theory into a baseless myth about magical happenings. Once we realize that light is never a particle, there is no choice to be delayed. Light starts as a wave and stays a wave through the whole experiment. But, you ask, what about when there is no interference and one or the other detector detects a particle? That brings us to the second problem. It neglects the detection process. When we consider the detection process, we see that, in both cases, when there is interference and when there is no interference, the detectors work in exactly the same way. So, they are detecting the same kind of thing, either a particle or a wave. When they detect waves, they also register single photons. 
So the detection of a single photon does not imply the photon is a particle, only that the amount of energy absorbed is quantized. Something strange is going on. When it is agreed that light is acting like a wave with interference, the photon's energy is split between the two detectors. That means the detectors are often triggered by less than a photon's worth of energy. This is the real mystery here. Finally, it violates time reversal invariance. All we know about electrons and electrodynamics tells us that their physics works the same whether our clocks are running forward or backwards. But when we run the experiment backwards in time, we run into a problem. When our photon runs backwards into the first beam splitter, it has a 50% chance of going through to the light source, but it also has a 50% chance of being reflected downward and out of the apparatus. <laughs> Then it will not be reabsorbed by the emitter as required by time reversal invariance. We get the same 50% chance of loss no matter which path the photon follows. The only way to guarantee that light will be reabsorbed by the emitter when we run the clock backwards is if we have two waves meeting at the first mirror. They will have exactly the right phase to cancel out the downward beam and send all of the light back into the emitter giving us time reversal invariance. Delayed choice is a myth. There is nothing to choose. Light is just a wave. It's never a particle, and so there can be no choice of whether it's going to be a particle or a wave in a particular experiment. The real mystery is in the detection process. We know that the detectors are capable of going off when there is less than a full photon's worth of energy impinging on them. Once one detector goes off, conservation of energy is going to prevent the other detector from registering the same photon. Wheeler was right when he said that one decides the photon shall have come by one route or by both routes after it has already done its travel. It is not that the photon actually does use one route or both routes after it has finished its travel. It is rather that we, with our wrong conceptual space, with our conceptual space in which a quantum can be a particle, decide that it couldn't have come as a wave, so it must have come as a particle. It is we who decide after the fact. Now I'm going to discuss an experiment which, despite its title, involves no choices and erases nothing. Here's the simplified layout for Kim et al.'s delayed choice quantum eraser experiment. The parts labeled D are single photon detectors wired to a coincidence counter. The BSs are beam splitters and M denotes a regular mirror. In the experiment, light from a laser passes through two slits and then illuminates a beta barium borate crystal. These crystals have a nonlinear response to light called spontaneous parametric down conversion. That means that a very small fraction of the light is converted into two rays of longer wavelength with a well-defined phase relation between them. In quantum mechanical terms, the photons are converted into two lesser energy entangled photons. Here, 352 nanometer ultraviolet light is converted into two orthogonally polarized beams of 702 nanometer infrared light. Since the beams have different polarizations, they can be separated by a Klein-Thompson prism, which I have not shown. One set of beams from the illuminated spots is focused on a detector, D0, by a lens I have also omitted for simplicity. D0 is mounted on a traverse mechanism driven by a stepper motor so that it can move along the X direction in the hope of detecting an interference pattern similar to that in Young's experiment. If you want to know more about Young's experiment, I discussed that in part one. The reason I say in the hope of detecting an interference pattern is that despite their explicit claim to the contrary, the data show no such pattern. I will explain this when I discuss the results. Meanwhile, the beams from the other polarization are directed into a path long enough to delay at 8 nanoseconds so that the observation at D0 will be finished before the erasing observation begins. 
The experimenters wish to show that later observations can erase information obtained from earlier quantum observations. Again, we will see that it does not. The delayed beams enter a custom interferometer where they each encounter a beam splitter reflecting part of the beam into detector D3 or D4. A detection event at either can only be the result of light traveling a single path. So D3 and D4 are said to provide which path data. The remainder of each beam travels onto normal mirrors where it is reflected to another beam splitter. While light in both beams is traveling simultaneously, it will be clearer if we view the path of one first. So look at the lower beam. It is reflected up to the third beam splitter where part of it passes through to detector D2 and the rest is reflected down to D1. Now consider the upper beam. It is reflected down to the same beam splitter where part of it proceeds to D1 and part of it is reflected up to D2. Thus, a count at either D1 or D2 can be the result of light following either the upper or the lower path. Their counts do not provide us with which path information. The electronics in the coincidence counter match counts at D0 with those happening 8 nanoseconds later at D1, D2, D3, or D4. Each match counts as a single coincidence count, and the number of counts in a fixed period is plotted against the position X of D0. Here are the results plotted by Kim et al. Their figure 3 shows the coincidence counts between D0 and D1. Clearly, an interference pattern appears as D0 is traversed along its x-axis. Note the claim that this is a, quote, standard Young's double-slit interference pattern, unquote, a claim repeated in the body of the article. Figure 4 plots the coincidence between D0 and D2. It is effectively the mirror image of figure 3, just as we would expect given the symmetry of the experiment. Recall that neither D1 nor D2 provide which path information. Finally, figure 5 gives the coincidence counts between detectors D0 and D3, which does provide which path information. It illustrates the lack of interference when such information is available. The authors conclude, the experimental results demonstrate the possibility of observing both particle-like and wave-like behavior of a light quantum via quantum mechanical entanglement. The which path or both path information of a quantum can be erased or marked by its entangled twin even after the registration of the quantum. So, what is the myth? I want to make it clear that the experiment itself is well designed and executed. I am not criticizing any of its technical details. The problem is that its interpretation is nonsense. There is no Young's two-slit interference. Our first clue is that while Young's interference pattern is symmetrical, the patterns shown in figures 3 and 4 are asymmetrical, so they can't possibly be Young's interference. Our suspicions are confirmed when we look at figure 5. Instead of seeing the peaks and valleys we would expect from Young's interference pattern, we see a smooth curve. Recall that figure 5 shows the correlation between D0 counts and D3 counts. If D0 actually saw a Young's interference pattern, there would be no D0 counts at these points to coincide with later D3 counts. So, D0 detects no Young's interference pattern whatsoever. This is despite the fact that two beams do converge at detector D0, just as in Young's experiment. But don't figures 3 and 4 show wave phenomenon? Of course they do, but it is not that in Young's experiment. What they show is a correlation between D0's exposition and the probability of a later count at D1 versus D2. For example, if D0 is here, we have a high probability of a D1 count and a low probability of a D2 count. In fact, the authors derive this correlation from standard quantum wave theory. No information is erased. No measurements change when observations at D1 to D4 are made. Just the reverse. 
The exposition of D0 when a count occurs allows us to predict the probability of later observations. Think about it. Claude Shannon, the founder of information theory, defined information as the reduction of possibility. Some things that were logically possible before we were informed become impossible after we are informed. If information were actually erased, then what was impossible would become possible again, a contradiction in terms. Counts at D1 to D4 do not give us less information, but more. Before they are observed, we have five possibilities. A count at D1, D2, D3, or D4, or no count possibly because of detector inefficiency. After the observation, these five possibilities are replaced by the one actuality, increasing rather than erasing information. There is no backward causality. We have just seen that observations at D0 let us make prediction on the relative probability of observations at D1 and D2. Clearly, causality goes forward in time in this experiment. What is erased if not information? The data collected at D1 and D2, as D0 is traversed in the x direction, allows no particle interpretation. On the other hand, data from D3 and D4 allow a wave interpretation. As I showed earlier, the sum of two wave type patterns gives us exactly the pattern that's observed at detectors 3 and 4. If one comes to the problem with the wrong conceptual space, with an a priori bias that quanta must sometimes be particles, then there's a problem. What we had thought of as a particle, we must now think of as a wave. If we do not insist that light is sometimes a particle, we have no misconception to erase.